I enjoy keeping my finger on the pulse of how the Catholic and secular media are reporting on the resurgence of traditional forms of Catholic life and worship. One can learn a lot by considering how other people see you from the outside. Often enough, they make mistakes, even occasional howling blunders, but I also find that they seldom fail to perceive with a mingled respect and curiosity something different, special, intriguing, something that is perceived as countercultural in a good way. I think there's more, to, there's more to it, I'm talking about secular media coverage, than everyone roots for an underdog, although that's certainly part of it. It seems that everywhere there is a thirst for meaning, for contact with reality, for self-transcendence. And it also seems that the modern world, especially thanks to the stranglehold of technology, the internet, constant communication, and social media, constantly thwarts that vital contact with original reality, that possibility of escaping from the prison of the self, that quest for ultimate meaning rather than ephemeral information. So whenever a newspaper or magazine or website runs a major story on the traditional Latin mass, I sit up and take note. Just such an article appeared on October 26th, not even three weeks ago, in, of all places, National Geographic. The article was written by Matthew Teague and bears the title, it's, it's a pretty long title for an article, These Devout Young Catholics Are Embracing the Old Ways. I had to smile at the subtitle, the movement embraces some old world traditions that even the church has referred to as backwards. <laughs> there is much I could say about this piece. It's got the usual mixture, as I mentioned earlier, of truth and um, <clears throat> not, not so much truth. <clears throat> but for now, I want to quote just two sentences that relate to my theme this evening. Each week, traditionalists gather at more than 1,200 sites, mostly in the United States. They embrace a version of religious life that had drifted out of fashion, the smells and bells of previous generations, and reach for symbols and language that bewilder the outside world, and which the congregants themselves may not fully understand. I thought that was an interesting comment in the article. Is this last observation that even folks in the pews, and perhaps, shall we admit it, the clergy as well, don't fully understand what they are seeing, hearing, saying, singing? Is that meant as a criticism or as a compliment? Or perhaps neither? Could it be an implicit question about whether there might be a positive role for not understanding things fully? I can't help thinking of the remarkable words in the Byzantine Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom when the priest, right before consecrating the bread and the wine, prays, You brought us forth from non-existence into being and raised us up again when we had fallen and left nothing undone until you brought us to heaven and bestowed upon us your future kingdom. For all this we give thanks to you and to your only begotten Son and to your Holy Spirit for all that we know and all that we do not know the manifest and the hidden benefits bestowed upon us. Let me shift gears. Nowadays, the slow movement has really taken off. You've probably encountered phrases like slow food, slow wine, slow travel, slow reading, slow art, slow cinema, slow fashion, and even slow conversation meaning one in which each person is given the floor to say all that he or she wishes to say without being interrupted, a technique that would be useful in many seminars at great books colleges. The basic idea is a cultural shift towards slowing down life's pace, letting things take the time they need in order to be good or optimal or fulfilling or even quite simply human in scale. There are many ideas and personalities involved in this diffuse, worldwide, slow movement, many of them plainly contradictory, but I think it would be fair to say that as a whole, it's a reaction against the rationalism and utilitarianism of the modern industrial age. The ubiquitous model of mass production, delivering the goods, whatever they are, as quickly and efficiently as possible, fails to distinguish between different kinds of goods and different ways of receiving them 
how quickness and efficiency may affect their quality, and how, in general, the modern approach fails to take into account the diverse needs and abilities of individuals and communities. So in my talk, I'd like to make a pitch for slow liturgy. I will explain why our basic mental framework should not be capturable in the question, what do I get out of attending the 60-minute Sunday Mass? But rather, what will I get out of an entire lifetime of faithfully immersing myself in the mysteries of the Mass? If liturgical reformers and church leaders make it their basic assumption that liturgy is to be assessed on the basis of what one can immediately understand in that 60-minute Sunday Mass, they are setting up the people of God for a catastrophic failure. They should be asking, rather, how a liturgy should be if it is to be capable of sustaining and rewarding an entire lifetime's participation, so that it will be experienced less as a repetitious and burdensome duty and more as an ever deeper entry into something both familiar and strange. In the heyday of liturgical reform, which was the decade from 1964 to 1974, and for many long decades thereafter, the avalanche of changes to Catholic worship were often justified by a few magical phrases that would be thrown about almost talismanically with an air of infinite superiority to the meager mentalities of lowly laity. The leading contender was certainly the phrase active participation, which turned out to be quite ironic considering how many millions of people simply stopped going to church altogether and therefore ceased to participate in any way. But along with that phrase, you'd often hear about the needs of modern man, meeting people where they're at, doing like the early church, and what is of most interest to me tonight, greater accessibility. The revised liturgy was supposed to be and was claimed and asserted to be more accessible. But this is a monumental smokescreen if ever there was one. After all, nothing is more or less accessible in the abstract and without further qualification. One must always ask, accessible to whom? And giving access to what? And for the purpose of dot, dot, dot. Almost exclusively, accessibility was understood as primarily or exclusively a verbal conceptual phenomenon. If you can immediately grasp this bite-sized chunk of content without further preparation, explanation, or remainder of bewilderment, then it's considered to be accessible to you. The object of such immediate and complete comprehension obviously cannot be God whom every orthodox theologian declares right off the bat to be incomprehensible. Nor can it be man, who, as being made unto God's image, is a mystery to himself. Nor can it be the world, which is far too complicated and vast to fit into man's mind, even if a thousand Einsteins were to chip away at it. Nor can it be the mysteries revealed by God in history and delivered in scripture, since, since each of these is a combination of all of the above. Therefore, a perfectly accessible liturgy, in the sense defined above, would have to be about nothing, address no one, and lead nowhere. This admittedly is a limit case, fortunately never reached. There is always a residue of unintelligibility in anything human beings do, even if they are trying to avoid it. To the extent that any elements of the traditional liturgy remained, the incomprehensibility of God, of man, of the cosmos, and of the mysteries of Christ remained as well. Still, the reform introduced a fundamental tension between allowing the liturgy to be mysterious, as it must be, and trying in the name of liturgical science to purge it of the very features that tended to make it awful, fearful, darksome, intricate, wondrous, and yet, paradoxically, also orderly and ordering, familiar and comforting, unassuming and free of invasive sources of irritation. It seems to me that there is a mighty irony at work in the revival of the traditional Latin liturgy of the Roman Church. In spite of all the hand-wringing of scholars and tinkerers about the horrible Middle Ages that led us into what Archbishop Bugnini called lack of understanding, ignorance, and the dark of night of a worship that lacks a face and light, 
That's how he described the traditional liturgy. The irony is that new generations find the old rites in general quite sufficiently accessible, indeed more so than they do the new rites, provided one has a broader and deeper definition of accessibility. The reason is not far to seek. The old liturgy appeals more consistently, more powerfully to the full range of reality, natural and supernatural, of what it is to be human, of how we express ourselves and what we are trying to express in words, gestures, songs, and quiet sighs. It appeals to all the senses, the various temperaments and personalities, the different levels on which our interior life plays out and intersects with the external world. The traditional Roman liturgy, and this is true of any traditional apostolic rite in Christianity, recognizes a truth on which psychologists never tire of discoursing. Human beings primarily communicate non-verbally. As a matter of fact, we are never not communicating something, even if we are not talking or, or have no intention of conveying a meaning. Orderliness and deferentiality speak volumes, just as carelessness and casualness do. A liturgy like any human ceremony is constantly communicating through every word, stance, gesture, position, action, and silence. The old liturgy, by harnessing and regulating these things in a harmonious way to bring out their full interactive meaning, is more communicative. In that sense, it proffers more to access and in more ways. The Reformed liturgy, by eliminating traditional nonverbal language and then leaving so much to chance and idiosyncrasy, thins the content and its delivery while mingling it with extraneous and contradictory matter. Many of these thoughts were prompted by a video I watched on body language that made me much more conscious of the importance of small and nonverbal details in the liturgy and therefore the importance of being aware of them and faithful to their proper execution. So altar boys, listen up. The expert interviewed Joe Navarro, looks at people from the point of view of an FBI agent trying to assess potential threats, the trustworthiness of witnesses, and so forth. In one particular minute of his video, he shares the following points. How we dress, how we walk, have meaning and we use that to interpret what's in the mind of the person. We are never in a state where we're not transmitting information. We're all transmitting at all times. We choose the clothes that we wear, how we groom ourselves, how we dress, but also how do we carry ourselves? Are we coming to the office on this particular day with a lot of energy, or are we coming in with a different sort of pace? And what we look for, we being the FBI agents, are differences in behavior down to the minutiae of what is this individual's posture as they walk down the street? Are they on the inside of the sidewalk, on the outside? Can we see his blink rate, how often he's looking at his watch? You can have a poker face, but you can't have a poker body. Somewhere it's going to be revealed. We talk about nonverbals because it matters, because it has gravitas, because it affects how we communicate with each other. When it comes to nonverbals, this is no small matter. We primarily communicate non-verbally, and we always will. That's Joe Navarro. Phrases like, we primarily communicate non-verbally, and we're never not communicating something, are very relevant to the celebration of Mass. Every gesture, for example, the speed of movement around the altar, where and when the priest is standing or sitting, whether the priest's gaze is directed out to the people or modestly downcast, how the sacred vessels are handled, treated, and how the blessed sacrament is approached and handled. Every gesture like this confesses what the celebrant and the people believe they are doing, or perhaps don't believe they're doing. <clears throat> Why is it that the liturgical reformers seemed so tone deaf or clueless about the most obvious things in life. Did they not realize that changing the bodily language, the gestures, postures, orientation, signs of veneration, custody of the eyes, would effect a sea change in mentality and spirituality? Or 
was it that they understood perfectly well, and therefore abolished piece by piece a nonverbal language based in the Catholic faith, substituting for it another with a different message. I am reminded of the loss of faith in the real presence of our Lord. This was not an unfortunate result of a lack of catechesis. That's the usual line that's put out there. It was the intended result of a renovated catechesis. It was not an accidental byproduct of liturgical reform gone awry. It was a premeditated outcome of a new ecclesiology that identified the worshiping community with the body of Christ and sought to oppose the supposed fetishism or magic of the Eucharistic cultists that had developed in the church for the previous thousand years. As Martin Mosebach points out with respect to Holy Communion, quote, an entire bouquet of respectful gestures had surrounded the sacrament of the altar, and these gestures were the most effective homily, which continually showed priests and faithful quite clearly the mysterious presence of the Lord under the forms of bread and wine. We can be certain no theological indoctrination of so-called enlightened theologians has so harmed the belief of Western Catholics in the presence of the Lord in the consecrated host as the innovation of receiving communion in the hand, accompanied by the abandoning of all care in the handling of the particles of the host. Yet, this is still Mosebach, yet can one really not receive communion reverently in the hand? Of course, that is possible. Yet, once the traditional forms of reverence were in place, exercising their blessed influence on the consciousness of the faithful, their discontinuation contained the message, and not just for the simple faithful, that so much reverence was not really necessary. And along with that, there consequently grew the initially unspoken conviction that there was nothing there that demanded respect." Unquote. Father Robert uh, Roberto Spataro, a professor of ancient Greek and Latin literature in Rome, makes a similar but broader point to Mosebox. Quote, humility is more than a virtue. It is the condition for a virtuous life. Watch the bows and genuflections the humble man makes faithfully before God in a spirit of obedience, acknowledging his sovereignty his love without bounds, his creative wisdom. Reason is not tempted to be puffed up, as happens in the revolutionary process, because in the old right, not everything can or ought to be explained by reason, which for its part is content to adore God without comprehending him. It turns to him through the means of a sacred language, differing from ordinary speech, because in the harmonious order of creation that the liturgy represents in its rituals, there is never a monotonous repetition or tedious uniformity, but a symphony of diversity, sacred and profane, without opposition, respecting the alterity of each. Here, reason also renounces an excessive use of words that unfortunately exists in the liturgical praxis inaugurated by the Novus Ordo, interpreted by many priests as the opportunity for pure garrulousness. In the old rite, on the other hand, reason appeals to other dimensions of communication, and besides words pronounced or sung, also gives silence a place. This silence becomes the atmosphere impregnated with the Holy Spirit in which believing thought and prayerful word is born." Unquote. What we do with our bodies is just as communicative as what we say with our lips. The liturgy should therefore govern the motions and dispositions of our limbs and senses, harnessing them as symbols of truth and instruments of sanctification. This will help us to pray, to enter more deeply into communion with the Lord, and to yield ourselves to truths that cannot be put into words or captured in concepts. As St. Paul says in the Epistle to the Romans, we should make our bodily members instruments of righteousness. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of iniquity unto sin, the sin of irreverence, of disrespect for holy things, of casual, haphazard, and inconsiderate behavior during our formal audience before the great king. But present yourselves to God in theocentric worship that governs our self-presentation as those that are alive from the dead, 
the living death of modern anti-natural, anti-Christic culture, and your members as instruments of justice unto God, the justice, namely, of the virtue of religion. After this discussion of nonverbal communication, I would like to circle back to my opening remarks about accessibility as a function of rational understanding. For this is an area in which many huge mistakes were made in the 20th century, mistakes from which we are still reeling decades later. It was and remains a commonplace of liturgical reform that the people in the pews must understand all the prayers and ceremonies. There must be no remainder, no residue of incomprehension. This drove the total vernacularization, the dumbed down translations, the saying of nearly everything out loud, the visibility of the priest versus populum, and so forth. Nothing must be left inaccessible, implicit, hidden, or difficult of access. What I find curious is that this is completely contrary to the normal way in which human beings are meant to learn and grow. As babies and children, we are constantly up against what we cannot understand. Those who spend time with little ones see heart-wrenching and sometimes amusing exhibitions of frustration every day as these eager souls struggle to clasp and navigate the giant worlds they must live in. Our intellectual growth occurs as a result of the inward drive to know. All men by nature desire to know, Aristotle famously said at the opening of his metaphysics. Wonder is the name of our reaction to what we cannot see through, cannot instantly grasp. In a healthy soul, this wonder then moves us to seek to understand. When we lose the capacity for wonder, we lose the capacity for learning. In the Gospels, we see several instances of incomprehension where our Lord does not say, okay, let's break down into synodal discussion groups and get to the bottom of this. Voting will follow afterwards and then a post-synodal dominical exhortation. No, that's not what you find there. He lets his companions stew in their lack of understanding because they still need to grow and they need the challenge of not getting it. Mary and Joseph didn't understand the words he was saying, Luke 2.50. His apostles didn't understand either, Matthew 16.9, Luke 18.34, etc. Jesus often did things without explaining why, as when he sent his apostles across the lake without him, knowing he would later walk across it and scare the living daylights out of them. That's in Mark chapter 6. Or when he slept in the hole during the big storm, remember that, Matthew 8 or when he escaped to go into remote places to pray in spite of the crowds clamoring for more sermons, Luke chapter 6. Scripture tells us that many of the most important things Jesus said were understood by his disciples only after the resurrection or after Pentecost. With his usual eloquence, Anthony Esselin explains why this is to be expected. Quote, the word of God is always beyond our comprehension and sometimes even beyond our apprehension. We never know all that it means, and sometimes we hardly know what it means at all, or that it means anything at all. It must be so. God is our creator. We cannot have it out with him in mere rational debate, as Job seems to, have, seems to want to have done. We must then wait upon him. We do not see so that we might obey. We obey that we might see. Increase of vision and understanding is dependent upon obedience. It is not I who say so. The Lord says it. If we love him, we will keep his commandments, and then he will dwell within us, making himself manifest to us. Many of those commandments will be hard for us to understand. Unquote. St. Augustine's De Doctrina Christiana, a work justly deemed the most important and influential writing on scriptural exegesis in church history, proposes that God, our teacher, has made parts of scripture difficult for us as a deliberate pedagogical strategy. Quote, some of the expressions are so obscure as to shroud the meaning in the thickest darkness. And I do not doubt that all of this was divinely arranged for the purpose of subduing pride by toil, 
and of preventing a feeling of satiety in the intellect, which generally holds in small esteem what is discovered without difficulty. Nobody, however, has any doubt about the facts, both that it is pleasanter in some cases to have knowledge communicated through figures, means images, metaphors, and that what is attended with difficulty in the seeking gives greater pleasure in the finding. For those who seek but do not find suffer from hunger. Those, again, who do not seek at all because they have what they require just beside them often grow languid from satiety. Now, weakness from either of these causes is to be avoided. Accordingly, the Holy Spirit has, with admirable wisdom and care for our welfare, so arranged the Holy Scriptures as by the plainer passages to satisfy our hunger and by the more obscure passages to stimulate our appetite." Unquote. St. Augustine, so wonderful. If all of scripture were transparently obvious, we would quickly get bored and toss the book aside. We would not be able to believe it held the words of the eternal, infinite, and therefore incomprehensible God. Yes, these words are proportioned to us and our abilities, much as the incarnation proportions God to our humanity. Yet they also outstrip our abilities and, as Esselin said, will always do so. The most audacious sin of biblical scholarship consists not in any particular error, but in the rationalism that aspires either to identify the text's supposed errors or to arrive at a total explanation with no remainders. Unpacking the, insight, the insights of Augustine, Joseph Shaw writes, quote, an opaque symbol may stick in the memory and stimulate the imagination more than a clear one, and it can more easily bear multiple and profound meanings. A symbol which conveys something too deep for words is not a symbol whose meaning can be explained in a couple of sentences. These realities were certainly not lost on the authors of scripture. Here we find a collection of stories, sayings, and other texts which are complex and frequently opaque. If many confusing passages can be clarified with a little exegesis, other passages, which appear reasonably clear at first glance, can, on closer inspection, reveal unexpected complexity. This is not exactly a problem. It is simply a reflection of the richness of the text. Our participation in God's word would not be improved by the substitution of a simplified children's version of the text. Our Lord spoke in parables not to confuse people or limit the impact of his preaching, but to reach the sincere seeker after truth who was prepared to ponder his words. The most baffling of stories, like Jacob wrestling with God, can be the objects of the most powerful religious art and make a home for themselves in readers' imaginative lives. Some things, again, can be understood by those who cannot articulate their understanding. Other things can rest in our memory before being activated like an unexploded bomb, perhaps decades later by some chance event or conversation. We should not expect or even desire to recover the full meaning of a passage of scripture without leaving anything behind as we might squeeze a sponge dry. We can rather look forward to seeing another aspect of it when we return to meditate upon it years later." Unquote. This Augustinian insight also finds application in regard to the church's traditional rites of divine worship. As visible, audible, tangible events that take place in our midst, such liturgies are proportioned to human abilities and needs. Right? They're for human beings, they're not for angels or for plants and animals. Yet they challenge us to go beyond where we happen to be at any point in our lives. The asceticism of penitential seasons and scattered days of fasting is an obvious way in which traditional rites challenge worshipers. But a more subtle challenge comes from the very length, complexity, and density of their prayers and ceremonies, which confront us with a content we cannot fully grasp all at once. It will take, in fact, a lifetime of patient experience and diligent pondering to get to the bottom of what the church with the inherited prayer of millennia is doing and conveying to us. The liturgy sparks our wonder. Why is this being said or done? Reflection 
or sometimes a flash of intuition shows us that what may have initially appeared random, incidental, awkward, even downright useless, is a venerable relic, a sweet secret, a precious mnemonic, a lesson in piety. Our humility grows when we realize that we will never, as a matter of fact, get to the bottom of it. The most poisonous mentality we could possibly bring to the liturgy is that of rationalism. The assumption either that the liturgy is full of errors in need of correction by specialists, or that it can be totally and adequately explained to the mental satisfaction of a person living in, say, 1945, or 1965, or 2025. Curiously, but not surprisingly, a centuries-old liturgical rite baffles people and attracts people in different ways, for different reasons, at different times across history, and even at different phases across the lifespan of one and the same person. This is as it should be. Were we to succeed in creating a liturgy perfectly accessible, transparent, and comprehensible to the people of our day, or to an individual man at a particular age of life, it would no doubt cease to be of much help to people from a sufficiently different period, or to the same person at a different age. Not to mention the fact, too often ignored it would seem by modern liturgists, that at any given moment a church building will be holding a large variety of people with quite varied backgrounds, abilities, learning styles, needs, and desires. The proportion of the congregation consisting of logical, analytical, word-oriented, aural learners will always be rather small. What of the infant mewling and puking and its harried parents? The daydreaming artist, the weary worker in search of a quiet pew, the old lady who basks in the warm light of the stained glass as she enjoys the touch of God without words. There is room for everyone in a Catholic church, but not in a rationalist right. Indeed, a good case can be made that the logical, analytical, word-oriented, aural learner needs the traditional Roman rite more than anyone else in order to be liberated from excessive attachment to rational analysis and thrown into a wonder-bearing milieu that eludes immediate resolution. We shouldn't forget that St. Thomas Aquinas, who was a fair candidate for the most analytical human being who ever lived, was nourished by a daily fare of two low masses, one that he offered and another that he served immediately after. In the monastic ambiance of the Dominican Rite, he had the contemplative leisure to yield himself to, in John Paul II's phrase, Eucharistic amazement. The beloved poem, Adoro te devote, is handed down to us as a prayer that Friar Thomas would recite during the elevations. The liturgy in reality must be rather vast and complicated and full of symbolic words and gestures if it is to offer plenty for anyone to connect with or hold on to or become hooked by. In this way, it is like scripture, a huge library of very diverse types of writing with something for everyone, but more importantly, something that goes beyond everyone. The mystery of God who simultaneously reveals and conceals himself, as if delighting to be chased and caught and chased again. St. John Henry Newman describes this with his usual eloquence. It is in point to notice also the structure and style of scripture, a structure so unsystematic and various, and a style so figurative and indirect, that no one would presume at first sight to say what is in it and what is not. It cannot, as it were, be mapped, or its contents catalogued. But after all our diligence to the end of our lives and to the end of the church, it must be an unexplored and unsubdued land with heights and valleys, forests and streams on the right and left of our path and close about us, full of concealed wonders and choice treasures. Every time I read Newman, it gives me goosebumps. Concealed wonders and choice treasures. Think of the veil draped in front of the tabernacle, the veil covering the chalice, the veils resting on the ladies' heads, the humeral veil over the paten held up by the subdeacon. All these veilings reveal something by concealing it, but without a logical plan that governs them, such as a committee might have drafted. 
Now, someone might take offense at Augustine's claim that God intentionally made the path to him difficult. Especially nowadays, it would be offensive to say this. In his letter, Desiderio Desideravi, Pope Francis complains about liturgy that employs what he calls a sense of mystery. A, quote, being overcome in the face of an obscure reality or a mysterious right. He complains about this. From the context, he seems to have in mind things like the priest with his back to the people, prayers said sotto voce in a sacral tongue, clouds of incense blurring the line of vision, the ringing of little bells and big bells during the elevations of the host and chalice, the making of many signs of the cross to which medievals attributed allegorical significance. These sorts of things heighten the feeling of something special, different, strange, beyond reach, in our midst, but somehow off limits. The Pope, in company with professional liturgists, has no patience for such things. Quote, he says, if the reform has eliminated that vague sense of mystery, then more than a cause for accusation, it is to its credit, unquote. How can one not be reminded here of de Tocqueville's description of American frontiersmen, which equally befits the modern Europeans who drove the liturgical reform? Quote, as it is on their own testimony that they are accustomed to rely, they like to discern the object which engages their attention with extreme clearness. They therefore strip off as much as possible all that covers it. They rid themselves of whatever separates them from it. They remove whatever conceals it from sight in order to view it more closely in the broad light of day. This disposition of mind soon leads them to condemn forms which they regard as useless and inconvenient veils placed between them and the truth. Unquote. Yet, when we try to expose the nakedness of reality, we are stymied. Just as we understand one thing, we stumble upon another gap that we cannot cross. By the, term, by the time we learn to cross that gap, another gap has opened. Can we truly deny that life, the soul, the universe, reality, above all God and the things of God, are deeply mystifying? and cannot be stripped bare in the broad light of day. To write off the sense of mystery would betray a Kantian belief that the human mind is capable of wrapping itself around God's revelation and digesting it for breakfast. As the Kant called it, religion within the limits of reason alone. Mystery is truth that is luminous and yet inexhaustible, unconquerable. As in Rudolf Otto's definition of the sacred, mystery is both fascinating and overwhelming, even at times terrifying. Mystery is ineluctably mystifying. Jesus mystified his parents and his apostles. He remains for all time the prince of peace and provoker of paradox, the truth that gives himself to us not as a possession, but as a life to live and a way to follow. We are promised that at the end, when we pass through the final mysterious gate of death, we will see him face to face, gaze upon his beauty, understand him at last, but still not comprehend. For only God is fully transparent to himself. There's not the remotest possibility of boredom in heaven. We are too busy resting in the eternal act, too enamored of love to fall back on ourselves. What do we mean by mystery anyway? As a professor of theology, I often wondered what new college students were thinking when they heard the word mystery in class. In the wide world out there, I suspect that the term only comes up in connection with novels, where the mystery, that is the initially unexplained crime, usually murder, has to be figured out, the clues deciphered, the inexplicable accounted for by a brilliant detective who, as we say, solves the mystery. The term means nothing other than a set of circumstances that are temporarily obscure due to lack of data and intellectual acumen. It is something that can be solved. The mystery is something you intend to get rid of, if you can. Another place where you find the word in common use today is in the David Attenborough-type nature programs, whose narrator will say something like this. 
The brown-crested biddybong bird's predilection for a diet of poisonous purple fungus is a mystery to ornithologists to this day, implying that they just haven't figured out the answer yet, but stay tuned for next year's documentary. To clear away these distracting reductionist meanings, I made a point of asking my students in theology class what we mean when we say that, for example, the blessed trinity or the incarnation is a mystery. They usually say, a mystery is something you can't understand, something you don't see and can't explain, a secret or a puzzle or a paradox, but maybe it will all get cleared up in the next life. God's a mystery to us here below, but surely he's plain as day in the world to come. It was a moment of special joy to be able to say in response, actually, no. God is an infinite mystery that can never be fathomed or comprehended. He will be a mystery to us forever in heaven, indeed more than he is now. But this assertion demands unpacking if one doesn't wish to be a tease. Fortunately, the heavy lifting has been done by one of the most brilliant theologians of modern times, Matthias Schaben, who writes in his masterpiece, The Mysteries of Christianity, and this is a long quotation, but worth every word of it. Christianity entered the world as a religion replete with mysteries. It was proclaimed as the mystery of Christ, as the mystery of the kingdom of God. Its ideas and doctrines were unknown, unprecedented, and they were to remain inscrutable and unfathomable. The mysterious character of Christianity, which was sufficiently intelligible in its simplest fundamentals, was foolishness to the Gentiles and a stumbling block to the Jews. And since Christianity in the course of time never relinquished and could never relinquish this character of mystery without belying its nature, it remained ever a foolishness, a stumbling block to all those who, like the Gentiles, looked upon it with unconsecrated eyes or like the Jews encountered it with uncircumcised heart. The greater, the more sublime, and the more divine Christianity is, the more inexhaustible, inscrutable, unfathomable, and mysterious its subject matter must be. If its teaching is worthy of the only begotten Son of God, if the Son of God had to descend from the bosom of his Father to initiate, it, initiate us into this teaching, could we expect anything else than the revelation of the deepest mysteries locked up in God's heart? Could we expect anything else than disclosures concerning a higher invisible world about divine and heavenly things which eye hath not seen nor ear heard and which could not enter into the heart of any man? Mysteries must in themselves be lucid, glorious truths. The darkness can be only on our side, so far as our eyes are turned away from the mysteries, or at any rate are not keen enough to confront them and see through them. There must be truths that baffle our scrutiny, not because of their intrinsic darkness and confusion, but because of their excessive brilliance, sublimity, and beauty, which not even the sturdiest human eye can encounter without going blind. Only God's cognition excludes all mysteries because it springs from an infinite light which with infinite power penetrates and illuminates the innermost depths of everything that exists. Mysteries become luminous and appear in their true nature, their entire grandeur and beauty, only when we definitely recognize that there are mysteries and clearly perceive how high they stand above our own orbit, how completely they are distinct from all objects within our natural ken. And when supported by the all-powerful word of divine revelation, we soar upon the wings of faith over the chasm dividing us from them and mount up to them. They temper themselves to our eyes in the light of faith, which is supernatural, as they themselves are. Then they display themselves to us in their true form, in their heavenly divine nature. The moment we perceive the depth of the darkness with which heaven veils its mysteries from our minds, they will shine over us in the light of faith like brilliant stars mutually illuminating, supporting, and emphasizing one another, like stars that form themselves into a marvelous system and that can be known in their full power and magnificence only in this system. Many of the points made by Shaban have their analogy again in the experience of the traditional Latin Mass. 
There we encounter a world of mysteries interlaced and overawing in which God is at home and we are, so to speak, the outsiders who have dared to enter. Our intellect is never fully adequate to the sheer massiveness and volume of what we behold, in part because it is presented to us in a density of overlapping words and actions that go beyond the powers of any one finite agent to grasp. Not everything makes sense, even after many visits. Thank God for that. My mind, your mind, is too small to compass the elaborate language of encounter distilled over thousands of years of pagan, Jewish, and Christian worship. We are allowed to be there and to absorb what we can, when and as we can, because it is good. Master, it is good for us to be here. There is always plenty going on up there, but also a strange serenity all around. At times so palpable it feels as if time has stopped, space has condensed, eons have collapsed, individuals have coalesced around the sovereign other who is more within than the innermost in me and higher than the highest in me. That last phrase was from Augustine. The specific perfection I've tried to describe about traditional worship of the church is one that authors on the subject frequently circle around as they seek words for something at once obvious and subtle. <clears throat> one commentator on the ancient mass notes the supreme fittingness of the silence that descends on a church during the Roman canon. Quote, the silence also harmonizes with the mystery of transubstantiation in which the material elements of the bread and wine are changed into the body and blood of Christ without the senses perceiving it or the created mind being able to comprehend it. The real presence and sacrificial life of the Savior under the sacramental species are concealed beyond all discernment. So the holy silence is quite suited to indicate and to recall the concealment and depth the incomprehensibility and ineffableness of the wonderful mysteries enacted upon the altar. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Unquote. That's the last line there was from the prophet Habakkuk. Descriptions like these match my own experience and that of many others who have shared their stories with me over the years. For us, one of the great and consistent attractions of the traditional Roman liturgy is that it precisely does not attempt to hand itself to us on a platter, affirming our rationalistic tendencies and patting us on the back for participation, A for active. Instead, it keeps its focus inflexibly on God and seems almost indifferent to whoever is around. The copious rubrics make the priest an animated instrument to recall St. Thomas's placid description, a tool, basically, the tool of Christ. We are allowed to be anonymous, quiet, focused, free, lost, all lost in wonder at the God thou art. A lady with whom I was corresponding wrote to me, and if you write to me, you're in danger of being quoted in one of my lectures, <clears throat> but I won't say her name, so. She writes, I continue to be awestruck by the overwhelming sense of God's presence in the TLM. I'm still reeling from the contrast with where I used to go, but in a good way. I finally understand all of the references to the Mass as a cosmic reality. I finally understand why preconciliar authors attained to such profundity and to such reverence for the Mass. I keep waiting for all of this to wear off as the novelty recedes, but it isn't wearing off. Deep down, I don't expect it to. As to that last sentence, I myself have been attending the Old Latin Mass for 30 years, and the sense of wonder, the regimented peace, the freedom of prayer, the desire awakened again and again for God, the joy and, frankly, relief of never seeing any human being as the center of attention, all of this hasn't worn off. This time outside of time, this immersion in God, has become the haven of my heart. It structures my day, my week, my life. I could not live well without it. 
a final clarification is in order. And with these comments, I'll be wrapping up. My thesis is not that we should just float sleepily in a sea of confusion. So I don't want people to get the wrong idea. Not understanding is beneficial to the extent that we seek to understand, just as wonder should provoke us to go further up and further in. For we are driven by grace to the vision of God, and likewise we are driven by grace to know the meanings of Scripture and to know the meanings of the liturgical rites. I mean, as I said, we won't get to the bottom of them, but we're supposed to make progress in them. The lover wants to know the beloved and everything about the beloved. A laziness sent, uh, contented with passivity would have nothing admirable about it. In a remarkable 1978 speech, Pope John Paul II quoted Cicero. He said, non enim tam preclatum est shire latine quam turpe nescire. It is not so much distinguished to know Latin as it is disgraceful not to know it. In other words, we mustn't be lazy about educating ourselves. We should acquire some knowledge of the principal language of Western civilization and of the Roman church. Assuredly, such knowledge does not reduce the mystery of the traditional liturgy. If anything, it intensifies one's astonishment at its spiritual subtleties and literary allusions. Intellectual enrichment and cultural literacy are always that way. So far from narrowing one's life, they multiply occasions for wonder and open new possibilities for contemplation. Beauty itself seems to grow as one's capacity to see it or hear it grows. Perhaps we could put it this way. The traditional mass is good, not because it baffles us or presents barriers, but because it humbles our pride and whets our appetite with the barriers as so many provocations to intimacy. The mystic is the one who ardently follows the truth into the fiercest thickets and fieriest embraces. The mass as the mystical representation, mystical representation of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross should be a place where everyday mystics are bred and fed, members of that body we call mystical. Against the rationalists of yesterday and today, the reformers at the Synod of Pistoia, the Periti at the Sacrosanct Council, let us thank God in the aforementioned words of the Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom for all things we know and do not know, for blessings manifest and hidden that have been bestowed on us. In my title, I said it is better not to understand everything immediately, but I would like now in conclusion to revise that title. On the one hand, it is impossible for us to understand everything immediately. That is a prerogative of God alone. And to the extent we are led to think we understand more than we actually do, we are being done a disservice. For knowledge and pride enjoy a subterranean link. And it is often for our good, for our humbling, that we are left in the dark. On the other hand, it is necessary for us to come to know the two greatest mysteries with which our minds are in contact namely God and our own souls, slowly, lest we be blinded by the truth, overwhelmed and confused. Just as it is part of the natural order that we are fed first mother's milk, then soft foods, then tougher foods, until we can eat nearly anything, so too it is part of the divine pedagogy in the spiritual life that, as St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, we start on milk and move eventually to meat. The traditional liturgy feeds us in just this way by starting with the milk of outward splendor, the pomp of the ceremonies, the sweetness of the music, the smells and bells that capture our attention and keep it focused on the external symbols, and then moving us over time to the meat of the prayers in their dense content. Think of the towering mysteries of the Roman canon and the subtleties of the rite that one comes to see only after years of attending it and for the understanding of which one must put in some effort of study and mental exercise. In short, traditionalists should challenge themselves and one another to live a life of prayer and study that fully accords with slow liturgy. For in this way, they will absorb its wisdom, vindicate its perfections, and extend its earthly empire, as I am sure we all wish to do. Thank you for your kind attention.